later in the service, we will have a, a very special litany of thanksgiving as we today prepare for a special celebration and retirement send-off for our longtime director of music and worship, Dr. Shirley Sands. And I can't tell, is she behind the piano up there? Or did she go and refresh herself getting ready for the, the gathering? I don't know. Is she up there? Okay. Well, we'll let her know that I acknowledged and publicly <laughs> affirmed her. And, you know, I want to, uh, to pause certainly to express thanks to God and to Shirley. And we all hope that she realizes uh, what a rock she has been here at Trinity for all these years. And as we build upon her, her ministry legacy, uh, we want her to know just how loved and appreciated she is and of the impact of her service. And so, Shirley, wherever you are, we hope that you know this, and we appreciate your service to the glory of God. A young boy went to the zoo with his father, and he was just mesmerized by the lion. They just stood there in front of that caged fence, looking at that lion in great awe. He's the king of the beasts, the father said. Well, why do they call him that, Daddy? Well, it's because he's the most ferocious animal in all of the wild. He's a real man-eater, too, he said. Well, the boy thought about this. That got his attention. He said, would he even eat you, the boy asked. And his dad said, well, I guess he would if he got out. The boy kind of studied the lion for a minute. And then he turned and he said to his father, Daddy, if he does get out, what bus is it that I would take to get home? <laughs> it's always nice to be prepared for any potential outcome, isn't it? The disciples of Jesus sometimes had that same childlike, partly selfish and partly just plain naive kind of questioning and wondering with Jesus. In this gospel, Mark chapter 10, it's so interesting to see James and John as they come to Jesus seeming to be almost oblivious to the fate which was awaiting Jesus. They do not seem to be very phased at all, not much ruffled by the tragedy of the suffering and of the death that Jesus had just finished explaining to them. It was right around the corner and he had just told him about it, and it was going to take place for him. But these two brothers came to Jesus, really quite matter-of-fact in their approach, but instead of asking him which bus they would take to get home, they're saying, can we have good seats when we get there, whatever that looks like. And so we think of children when you think of James and John, for they come with this this frame of mind, Jesus, good old friend, buddy of ours, we have a favor to ask kind of thing. Would you do something for us, they ask. And Jesus, interestingly, doesn't scold, doesn't become angry at this. He knows that they do not yet understand what is to come. And he has some very important lessons to teach them here. And so he simply says, what is it that you want to ask? Well, it's like this. When you are in your future glory, they say, and we don't know an editorial comment, I guess. We don't know here whether for sure they believe this will come in their time with him during his lifetime and theirs in his human glory as a king or as a military hero. It seems likely that's what they're hoping for and anticipating, or if they might believe that it will come once he is devoured by the man-eating Pharisees and scribes and chief priests that he has just referred them to. But regardless, they had vision. They had visions of Jesus in some future state of glory, and so they asked him, can we be close to you then? Can we share that power and that authority? And so we would like positions as lieutenants, we think we would make great lieutenants for you, so please, if you would, allow us to sit at your right hand and at your left. Jesus said to them, you don't really understand what it is you're talking about. And so he went on to say, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink, be baptized 
with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with. And this is what they are failing to understand because they know that the kingdom will come, but they, what they do not grasp is how it will come and at what cost it will come. And we know, of course, as we sit here in 2018, we know how it turns out. We have the benefit of hindsight, but they didn't know what we now understand. And so again, like children, their response is immediate. Can we do that? Oh, you know, as if, as if it's a trivial issue. Yeah, we can, we can have that baptism and we can drink that cup as if, it's, as if it's just kind of a fun or matter of fact or attractive thing because they don't see the hardship. I think it's sort of like how some of us might remember as a child we saw the wagging tail of the little puppy in the Humane Society or the pet store, and of course we want to bring it home, and so mom says, will you feed and water and brush it every day? Or dad says, will you clean up the dog do and take him on daily walks, even if it's 12 below, but it feels like 114 because of the windshield? And of course we say, oh yes, and I'll get good grades, and I'll always obey you for the rest of my life and keep my, right, my room clean, all of these things. We think... It's not a bad way to go. And so we say all these things with genuine sincerity. We actually believe it in the core of our hearts when we say it. We believe it to be true. And all a parent can do sometimes is nod and smile and say, I'm sure you will. Because there's nothing to be resolved by arguing over these matters as relates to reality. So here Jesus Knowing much more than his friends James and John, he says to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism, yes, you'll be baptized with that. But to sit at my right hand or at my left, it's not mine to grant you. And when the other disciples heard about what was going on, they became angry. But this is when Jesus used this conversation as a teaching moment, and it becomes just that for us today as well. And he explains just exactly how different is God's way than the way of the world. Jesus lifts up for those of us who are followers of Jesus. He says that whoever among you wishes to achieve greatness must become a servant. You want to be first, highest, best, strongest, greatest, most awesomely powerful, whatever? Then Learn how to serve others. Learn what it means to truly be a servant in the manner of Jesus himself. There's an author by the name of Robert Coleman. He has a book that's entitled Written in Blood. He tells the story of a 10-year-old boy, Taylor, whose sister Madison was in need of a blood transfusion the doctor explains very carefully that Madison has the same condition that Taylor had, had uh, recovered from about two years prior. And Madison, it appeared, was not responding to various treatments so well. And so it looked now like her best chance of recovery and of survival was in receiving a transfusion from someone who had previously conquered that same disease. And since the brother and sister had the same blood type, this boy was the ideal donor. Well, the doctor talked through all of this and tried to explain it the best he could with the parents and the children. The boy seemed to understand, and finally came the question, Taylor, he said, so will you be willing to give your blood for Madison? And he hesitated just for a moment, his lip trembling a bit, sure, for my sister, he said. And so the two of them were all prepped and they were wheeled off together, Madison pale and thin and Taylor robust and healthy. Neither spoke, but when their eyes met, Taylor gave her a big grin and they got to work on them and on his arm and there he watched as his blood began to flow uh, through the tube and as he watched all of this, his smile faded just a bit and when it seemed that the ordeal was almost over, he his voice shaking just a little bit, broke the silence, and he just had one clarifying question. He asked when he would die. So, of course, in hindsight, maybe I didn't explain it all that well, right? And so 
It was then the doctor and parents realized why the hesitation that this little boy had. And think about it, in the mind of a 10-year-old, you are asked to give your very blood for your sister, right? And so in his mind, that meant he was giving his life. And so in that brief moment of consideration, he had made quite a decision, hadn't he? I'd like to ask you today, what is the toughest decision that you have ever been asked to make? When was the last time that you were put to the test? I mean, I mean, really tested in a manner which would potentially result in very significant personal sacrifice to you for the benefit of another person. Because that's God's definition of what true greatness is all about. So friends in Christ, we observe those two brothers, James and John, and their rather bold, perhaps even arrogant question of Jesus, and we can't help but smile a little bit at the, at the perceived naivete out of which that request is even made, until, of course, we remember that whether this remarkable dialogue and question was posed 2,000 years ago or this very day, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? The point remains that the Son of Man, Jesus said, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Yes, Jesus was king. Jesus is king. He came not to be served, but to serve. And so by serving and ultimately by giving himself the price that was paid for your freedom and mine out of his love for us. Please join me in prayer. Gracious Lord Jesus, as we face opportunities and decision points or forks in the road of life entering into this coming week and beyond, we would ask, Lord God, for your influence, for your encouragement, and for the wisdom of your guiding spirit, that we would take that road less traveled of service to all and of personal sacrifice in your example and to the glory of your holy name. Amen.